Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 350. That's 350. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, getting there. Still on the older kombucha, you know, still relaxing in the glistening sunlight of UK. Like sunlight, I guess, some sort of sunlight, but whatever it, wherever you are listening to this, wherever you are watching this, thank you so much for joining me on the show. If it's your first time watching via YouTube, of course, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, try and leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to go ahead and support the podcast, please feel free to do so via the Patreon link down below. That's patreon.com forward slash Agostino. For as little as one dollar, you'll get access to my entire library of shows, as well as being able to listen to the full podcast episode a couple of days before everyone else gets to see it on YouTube. So if you want to listen to the show ahead of time in full audio, crisp and clear, then make sure you sign up to the Patreon. For as little as one dollar, you can get access to that. And the link is down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Click on that one and get going. Anyway, all that nonsense out of the way. How are you guys doing, man? How's, what's the job? Good, wherever you are, I'm assuming, right? Um, unless you're in um, Lebanon at the moment, right? Uh, an explosion happened in the middle of Beirut. So far, no real details. Some you know, rumors going around that it was some sort of what warehouse where they were storing fireworks or something. What actually started off the initial explosion, no one actually knows, but yeah, it's a whole lot of madness going on in the world right now during 2020. It seems as if, you know, we're living in the upside down, right? Whatever is normal is not normal, whatever is normal, hmm, whatever was not normal is normal, right? It's just complete mess, a complete mess wherever you are. So I guess um, get some solace and get some comfort from knowing that everyone else is going through some mess up situations as well it's a bit macabre to say that but i think that's the most you can do in these trying times and i guess don't blame yourself for any predicament you might see yourself in or you have got yourself in over the last few months because i think it's been unprecedented man imagine living in lebanon right and living a fairly carefree life and then all of a sudden in the middle of a pandemic you know a supposed fireworks factory or whatever depot i don't know what it is blows up in the middle of your city Right, it's gonna send shockwaves. Right, I mean, it's not even you know, including anyone that's passed away or the fatalities. It's gonna be a distressing point. So, we're all going through it. We just all need to kind of you know try our best to be somewhat cordial to each other. I hate the whole be kind thing. It sounds really cucky, but whatever we can do in order to make sure we don't make people's lives um, that much more difficult or strenuous or just sad. Just try and do it in it. That's the best you can do, I think, over these times because we're all going through it in our own different way. Um, to get all the dark stuff out of the way as well, RIP um, Ryan, Frank Ocean's brother. I don't actually know how you pronounce their surname. Um, unfortunately, it seems like he was involved in an accident yesterday. Oh, no, the other day, actually. No, on the weekend, on Sunday, he was supposedly, him alongside a friend, I'm assuming, who were in the car, flipped it and totaled it. And for some reason, the news coverage decided to film the fiery um, debris as it's lying in the middle of the road for everyone to see, which is, you know, super messed up in it. Like, kind of like a, a TMZ type of thing. But it also kind of weirdly reminds me of that movie called Nightcrawler um, about that guy that goes around chasing is I think it's, it's called ambulance chaser right where you go around and you try and get like b-roll footage of um, accidents and stuff and also actual cover stories of you know horrific crashes or hit and runs or stick ups whatever it may be and you sell them to the various news networks and only in America I guess they do the same thing in the UK I'm not going to try and paint this out to be saints but bloody hell man what a mad occupation so yeah um, R.I.P. to Frank Ocean's brother is pretty again like I mentioned before everyone's going through trying times um, just imagine what he's living through right if you're familiar with Frank Ocean you'd know that he absolutely adores his little brother um, I'm pretty sure he featured on an interview um, on what on the album I think it might have been Endless that was the album that he has featured on an old album an old interview from when Ryan was like 11 or something pictures of them around you know together with his mum and stuff like he absolutely adored that guy I think he, he's even have I think Frank Cushion even has a a song like a demo song that never came out or that was underneath his a former alias that he kind of dedicates to his brother about not growing up too quickly i remember back in the day he listened to that so i can't imagine what they're going through as a family man like again you know no amount of riches is going to um prepare you for 
you know, a member of your family passing away, especially in such tragic circumstances, man. So yeah, RIP to Frank Ocean's brother Ryan. For some prayers go out to his family in these testing times and madness, absolute madness. And again, filming it, you know, if you're press people, it's just ugh, I don't know what's wrong with people these days. But hey, what can you do? Next on the list, um, we have here some funny, well, not funny news, but some interesting news that if you're from the UK, you'll be familiar with. But if you're from if you're from outside the UK, you'll also be familiar with it. Pizza Express, the pizza branch made famous by Prince Andrew during his car crash television interview when he had to sort of, you know, um, persuade the public that he wasn't pedo, that he wasn't a nonce and it didn't really go across too well, in it? But um, you're familiar with him dropping the whole Pizza Express in Bolton as a credible alibi. So it seems like, you know, Pizza Hut or Pizza Express, sorry, has um, been affected by the pandemic too. Headline here is from the BBC saying Pizza Express may close 67 outlets and cut 1,100 jobs. Which, you know, makes complete sense really, um, considering the times we're living in. But it also got me thinking, who the hell goes to Pizza Express nowadays, right? It's a really odd establishment in the UK. Um, it's sort of like an upscale version of a pizza restaurant, right? A regular one that you go in and pick up your thing and go home. They don't really do anything different. I don't feel like maybe they were the first establishments to have like um, wood stove, wood stove ovens and stuff, right? Maybe they had one of those. Um, maybe it was the fact that they were all thin pizzas. That's the thing, because you know I remember those era when I used to, when I was growing up where. All the pieces we had were deep dish, right? That was kind of the thing that everyone wanted, I guess, because you wanted more bang for your buck. So you thought the that was again that was when your our culinary uh, palette wasn't as refined as it is now, or mine especially. You'd always assume the deep dish would be more filling than the thin crust, right? That you do actually call it. It's not actually a thin crust. It's just what a regular pizza might be like, right? I guess a Chicago style pan fried like dish sort of, you know. Um, casserole thing is completely different but w as soon as a restaurant like a frank amanka pops up right which is essentially like um you know like an upgraded version of peace express and with a far better range of food and you know um far better experience sit dining in as well you try to think to yourself like who would legitimately go to peace express but then i think about it and i think whenever i've passed or walked by the main branch in liverpool street it's always rammed and i think part of the allure of peace express is the fact that you can sit indoors sit indoors have a meal chat catch up with some friends maybe order a cheeky alcoholic beverage and be on your way but you know you can't necessarily do that in i don't know name your space a dominoes right they didn't even have restaurants do they but um this is interesting um approach i guess it, it then maybe vindicates what dominoes does right in terms of just being able to pick up and order takeaway there's no sitting in so i think those restaurants are probably going to be okay especially domino's they tend to not have that many branches in the uk it seems like um they have there they have them dotted around like i don't know east london is a good example or even south london they have like i don't know six or something it feels like and you have to just order um from wherever's nearest and hope it gets there on time but that model is fairly you know rock solid you're not gonna be able there's no need to cut back on um pizza what do you call it delivery points is it really there's no real point of it but a restaurant it's not going to work and it made me think when it was actually founded and you know what pizza express was founded in 1965 1965 pretty nuts isn't it that probably explains why it's been around for so long and it also explains why um they're still existing even in the midst of a franca manca because that was only launched in what 2008 it feels like but you still feel like 2008 between 2008 and between now there was enough time elapsed for customers to become to be get you know to have that first experience going to a frank america first experience going to like a pizza pilgrims which came a bit later and to be like you know what i don't want, need to do this i don't need to be subjecting myself to these um because again pizza express also has you know a dog shit menu man the food is really expensive as well right for what it is i think a, a lady on this article actually mentioned it in one of these tweets further down says um this one says, uh, just cost my sister a fortune to go here for a birthday tea. I, I love when people say tea. Um, it is way overpriced, so not shocking that it may have to cut jobs. Sad for those that work there, but you can't charge a ridiculous price for a nine inch pizza. Exactly. That's what, it, It's even smaller than nine inch. I'll say it's probably eight. And don't get me started on the price of a bottle of wine. <laughs> Absolutely madness. 
But, you know, what, what can you do? So I guess it's a pandemic affecting Peace Express. Don't feel too bad for yourself if you're in a sticky situation at the moment. It seems like everyone is getting it in the bloody neck. What else we got on the list here? So many things to talk about. I'm going to catch up on a few bits and pieces from obviously the Brian Kellen um, sexual assault and rape allegations, you know, other bits and bobs that's happened on social. Going to grab on top of those. Um, of course, going to talk about what's happening with Joey Diaz and maybe the potential death of the church of what's happening. But I think more so they're taking a bit of a hiatus. There's also some news on Joe Rogan. There's also other news on illegal house parties or illegal raves in New York and Paris. And just general impressions about what we may see coming forward with Sneaker Day from Nike that's coming up. There's a chance for some of our sneakerheads to purchase some shoes that we were unable to get when they first dropped. Um, we're probably going to all catch a lot of L's, but hey, it's the hope that hope it's the hope that kills us, isn't it? It's the hope that kills us. Um, so let's get on in to it. Number one news to kind of catch you up on, um, pointing in the right direction. I did an interview with uh, Chris from Crash and Talks a few days ago, which went pretty good. Apart from me forgetting to turn on off, apart from me change, forget to change in my settings and putting the you know this mic on instead, I had the mic going through my bloody laptop like an idiot. So it looks like I'm just using the mic as a prop. But I swear this mic does work, as you can hear. But whatever, I did a really short, uh, well, an hour long interview with Chris. We spoke about loads of things concerning cancel culture, some stuff about Chris D'Elia, some stuff about um, the ongoing court case between Amanda Heard and uh, Johnny Depp. What else we spoke about? We spoke about, do, 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 and a few other bits and bobs, actually. It's a really informative chat. I'm not going to lie. I had a great time talking to him, and I want you guys to go and support his show, of course, his platform. Make sure you sub on his page or his channel. Give him a lot of love. Leave him a comment. And, of course, check out the interview that I had with him. I'll put the link to the interview down below for you to click on it. There's no point in me clicking on it now and you know showing you a video of myself talking whilst I'm talking to you now. But I swear it does exist. That is me on Crash and Talks. That is me on Crash and Talks. So definitely check it out. I'll link it down below for you guys to see. Um, next on the list here to quickly go over before we move on, we have news about. Should we go to Chris Morning or William Rooney? No, let's go to the George Floyd thing. Did you hear about George Floyd? So, um, footage, well, the body cam footage from the George Floyd unfortunate passing has been released. And it kind of raises a few questions in it about why the narrative around George Floyd's death was painted in a certain way. It didn't really need to, right? Um, essentially, the footage just released. I'm not going to play it because I think it's a little bit, you know, a bit OTT. You probably will see in the original clips that went around with him essentially crying out for his mum in his dying moments and stuff. But the body camera footage or the body cam footage just shows the initial things that happened prior to him actually getting arrested or putting the cuffs on him and it paints a completely different picture from what we were led to believe right of course it doesn't um it doesn't really justify the fact that he died in police custody i think in general american police tend to have a bit of a um they, they get a bit too handsy when it comes to arresting or when it comes to uh figuring out how to sort out an issue with someone right if someone's going through something a manic episode or whatever it may be right they have a they only have, seem to have like one gear right it's either zero to or 100 and of course you know um if you're unfortunate and you happen to live in a um let's say in a poverty stricken area more likely than not you're gonna feel the full brunt of that more so than people that live in you know in more affluent or people that have more affluent means so the first thing that comes to mind when you see the George Floyd in video, the body cam image, is that number one, he was high out of his mind completely, right? He was kind of clenching his jaw, foaming at the mouth a little bit. He had little white crust bits all along of his white corner and just being manic, repeating things again and again and again. So obviously he was high off something. Who knows? Meth, PCP, fentanyl. We have no idea. Um, I think the toxicology report said that he had quite a bunch of things in his system at the time. You know, again, that's no excuse for someone to be murdered, but that's one thing to note and then of course police officers having to encounter somebody that's that high and then having to kind of you know calm them down so that they can inquire as to the crime that occurred is also probably a little bit difficult i'd imagine for police officers to do especially when there was three was it four of them right at the same time i can imagine there can be a bit of weird power play but it did make me think when i saw the video because i think there's one bit where 
he's sort of sitting down and then immediately they come at him with guns drawn or in a, in a manner that seemed a bit aggressive, right? It did make me think, um, should it even be a crime to attempt to pass a fake £20 note in a liquor store? Should that be something that requires the police to come in with a full force to try and take you down? Of course, some police officers might argue and say, hey, you never know. He might be the point of contact. We need to bust an illegal currency ring somewhere, right? A counterfeit ring somewhere. He might be that kind of person. But usually, if he is the one of the foot soldiers that's been given a fake 20, he has no idea who's making them, right? He's probably, you know, most criminal organizations don't let foot soldiers or people that they kind of, you know, dispose on the streets have any sort of access to them. It's never going to happen. So it's very strange that they'd want to go in really ham on him, especially as well, if you, if you if you think about it, I would assume that someone like a George Floyd or somebody in his position is probably very familiar with the police, right? They probably know of him. They probably had to maybe, you know, take him home a few times and when he's been drunk or point him in the right direction or tell him to wake up, whatever, right? He's probably been in that situation where he's encountered police officers numerous times. So for them to go at him so hard in the beginning, right knowing who he was and what he meant to the com not what he meant to community but his place in the community was a bit excessive like it's like you know you wouldn't go uh you know with a full meat wagon right and try and pick up a couple of homeless people that live in around the corner from you because you know those guys right they, they should know who those people are they should know who the local crackheads are they should know who they are i'm not saying he was but come on um and then uh, the what, one thing that was really, really distressing actually was that the actual reason why he ended up on the floor in the first place was kind of his own fault in his maybe panic state. He was complaining that he was claustrophobic and he didn't want to sit in a car alone. The police officers kept telling him they're going to lower the windows and he didn't want to, he didn't think that was enough. He wanted to get out. He can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. They eventually take him outside. And when they do, that's when they place him on the floor because they, they can't, I guess they don't have any confidence in being able to restrain him standing up because he's a big dude, isn't it? And of course, that makes you think again, right? Why are they unable to restrain somebody, even if they happen to be quite big, right? There should be a technique. There should be a way to rest restrain somebody without ha requiring four officers to lay on top of him, right? With all their weight and one to have his knee directly on his neck, which is, you know, apprehensible, really. And again, it's just it's just a really distressing situation all in right because number one the media lied right and told us one thing tried to paint george floyd out as some you know innocent not in this well let's say totally innocent guy who happened to be mistaken for somebody else and all of a sudden he lost his life no he was kind of you know by the letter of the law he was doing something illegal mm -hmm. supposedly again we don't know because you know they could have easily planted that note on him they could have easily you know the kid that called him out could have easily been mistaken we don't know but regardless right to deal with somebody that is trying to pass a 20 pound a fake tw 20 dollar bill like that is just beyond reproach you just cannot do that you shouldn't be involved in a situation where somebody's trying to pass a bill off and then suddenly you're involved in a fisticuffs or some sort of tussle that doesn't make any sense that's poor police work and that's what that video basically proves that the police don't get good training it's a pretty crappy job, right? For the most part, I'd assume day-to-day -day police officers are having to deal with situations that involve people who are intoxicated or high or whatever it may be, more so than they're dealing with actual violent crime, um, with actual robberies, with things that actually damage and hurt the community or the, you know, the residents of that community more so directly. They're having to, you know, essentially try and babysit grown men and grown women who have decided to, you know, throw their lives away via drink and alcohol i'm not saying that george floyd did but you know that's what they're doing day to day so you can only imagine um, especially if you come into it with your own little prejudices with your own bigotry um with your own distorted view on what the world is like i can imagine and a bit of a power complex right imagine that's such a bad 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 combination for a piece of self or for a civil servant it doesn't really make any kind of sense so that's what you got from the video really from watching it you know he obviously wasn't, you know, completely all there at the time, but it's just sad to think, you know, someone passed away during those circumstances, but it's also quite gnarly to think about what's kind of transpired since, right? Because we've seen loads of these body cam videos, I feel like anyway, you see loads of these clips, the videos of somebody having a really 
mad time with a police officer and you know nothing really comes of it you know the police officers get acquitted the social media posts die down everyone kind of moves on but it feels like people are still stoking the flame of this um of this moment which is great to see i think in general i think if you live in america and you want some kind of change in terms of how police deal with minorities in um less than affluent areas you're going to need to just keep pounding the pavement you're going to need to just keep you know ringing the alarm and just continually going on and on about this because you can't let go of the moment you have to seize this moment it's the only moment in time i think that there's actually going to be some real change of course there's been some nonsense along the way but that is you know that's the nature of the game it is what it is but for those people that are actually trying to enact some real change this is the moment you have to seize it with both hands it's just a shame you had to come off the back of some dude dying because you know he decided to try and buy a drink with a note that probably wasn't kosher but you know what can you do man what can you do next let's get on to the main um meat and potatoes of the few last few days and it? it's been absolutely going off when it in terms of uh brendan shaw and brian kellen or mostly brian kellen and his accusations or the allegations against him um concerning some past encounters he had with the ladies um one specifically of course from rape from back in the day i think what was it in the 90s or something right he was accused of rape or allegedly accused of rape by this lady that finally came out and basically spoke her piece via the la times and so far it feels like um it feels like the vitriol against Callan has sort of died down, which is good to see, right? Because, you know, he does need his day in court. I think cancelling somebody based off allegations is completely not on. I think everyone deserves that moment to defend themselves uh, the right and proper way. And if they're innocent, then let them go about, you know, living their life, doing their thing. So we have an update on this story via Brendan Shaw and the Los Angeles Times. I guess he recently went on his podcast which he decided to do off the back of these allegations because there were some rumors going around that oh he might not do the show because brian callan's been accused of this and that and you know it's the fire and the kid it's those two they're not gonna do it but i always assumed brian would brendan would do the show i think with with, with the pandemic happening um with the lack of rev with the lack of being able to make money on the road as a comedian which is his real bread and butter day to day i'd assume um it would make sense that he would try his best to protect his main cash cow or his main source of creative expression all that will lucky and maybe and keep the show going and i think because the last two couple of the last few shows i've watched mike Caffold was a host and i don't know who the other one was the other time but they've been all right you know he can still do the show with a guest co-host it does work obviously it's more obviously it's better with callan they're done their kind of chemistry works better but you know sometimes a bit of a break can be good to refresh the relationship refresh the chemistry because it was getting a bit dull i think a lot of fans did kind of feel they were sort of like running out of things to say they were going through some personal moments it felt like on camera you could kind of feel that they had a few bad days but i think the guest show things usually work pretty well and to be honest as well which is a weird thing to say i think it actually brings out the best in brendan right he can be a bit annoying especially since covid and the pandemic he's just you know he's become intolerable sometimes but i think the best he could the best of him comes out when he has a guest that doesn't really he doesn't speak to all the time he lets them speak they have a bit of banter he take a piss out of himself it feels a bit more organic so anyway brendan callan got on um to find the kid as the los angeles times here says brian callan's podcast co-host brendan shaw defense comedian and made allegations so we're going to go through exactly what he said and kind of i'll offer my opinion as we go along <clears throat> so it says the following by amy kaufman of course it says the following it says um the co-host of brian callan's podcast is standing by the comedian as he faces sexual assault um sexual misconduct allegations sorry brendan shaw a former ufc heavyweight who is callan's other half on the fire and the kid podcast said in a new episode on monday that obviously i stick by the man that he called his partner in crime. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> That's probably a bad phrase to use, right? Considering the crime that's being alleged, but hey. He said, but Shaw did not comment specifically on the accusations Callan is facing, saying that he would let his friend speak for himself. Which is fair, isn't it? I think this goes to show that I think some people were um you know, pontificating that oh Shaw didn't let him do the show because he wants to protect this and that but it seems that like they're still in contact and they're sort of trying to sort it out between each other and it seems like for the most part most of his friends are backing him up which is nice to see in it you know LA comedians and LA Hollywood types can be fucking annoying with how 
plastic and you know flip floppy they are with their friendships but it's good to see you know that there's there's still some uh loyalty in some places it continues it says um he said can has asked me not to go hard in the paint for him on the show because apparently if i say what i want to say it's going to get Callan in more trouble and bring more attention to Callan. so my hands are a little bit tied i think that's true i think that's fair to say he said that shed Shaw, who pivoted to stand-up comedy after his usc career he says which is very tough for me very very tough for me because i think you guys know how much i love brian and obviously i stick by brian Callan. That's a fair statement, and I like that he's backing up his friend again. I think that's nice to see. It's actually interesting that this is a far better response already than how they responded to the Crystal Lee accusations. When, again, not comparing, you know, nasty allegation with nasty allegation, but if you have to be, if you have to be honest on paper. What's the worst allegation? Being accused of rape and essentially, and maybe three other cases of sexual misconduct, which sort of marry up to your personality and the stories that you've said on the podcast, right? Allegedly. Or being accused of being a pedo and then when you look into the story it's him messaging a girl when she's 18 or 16 and then messaging her back when she's you know of age weird and creepo stuff but not exactly pedophilia or grooming right but they went hard in the it looks like he's going hard in the pay with callan most on did with delia maybe as a because they learned their lesson with how they dealt with the delia stuff i don't know or maybe because generally they think delia is actually in the wrong and there's more news to come out who knows but it's interesting to see that they've dealt with this far better than they did with delia stuff next one it says that short statement came a day after callan took to instagram to defend himself against uh claims from four women who told the times that they had been sexually mistreated by the 53 year old the like point is age there that's ouch um in his instagram video the goldbergs actor again denied all allegations which include rape sexual harassment and disturbing comments when they put them in words like that it just makes you sound like a monster and it? it's like god damn said so, um he vowed not to post a statement and disappear but then said he was obviously taking a leave of absence from the fire and the kid which i think in retrospect is a good thing i think when you're dealing with something like this trying to get on a podcast and make jokes and you know quint you know their, their famous quote trying to get in a podcast and make dick jokes doesn't make any sense and more likely than not especially oh what shop said earlier about him telling me hey don't talk about my 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 thing on the podcast makes sense as well because if you know anything about show sure you know he's you know he's loose lips mcgee in it right if you you can't tell the two people in la you can't tell secrets uh what no three people bobby lee uh burt kreischer and brendan shaw right they will definitely free under the bus sometimes inadvertently right just because they get excited and they just reveal stuff and then suddenly you know you're having to defend yourself from allegations or supposedly cheating on your wife when you're on the road you don't want that um and continue says on monday's episode Shaw persisted that it was callan's decision to um momentarily distance himself for the podcast noting that he was also in the midst of recovering from covid19 and an idly to lip surgery <laughs> <laughs> he said i've never seen him like this brian's exhausted mentally and physically said sure but i hope brian figures it out and i think he will in due time brian will be back it's funny though isn't it like how life comes at you and it just again it's not funny in terms of him i'm sure he's going through stuff and again praise up for the guy and hopefully he bounces back and he's able to prove his allegations are false but it's just interesting how life hits you right it's never one hit it's always in threes in bunches right pandemic comes along and essentially eviscerates eviscerates the entire LA, la comedy scene's income on the road especially then off the back of that you know allegations um center around one of the you know mainstays of that la scene in crystalia right someone very popular somebody who everybody used for views to get on their podcast a funny dude in general right that rocks the industry people start thinking whoa if he's getting in trouble imagine me and then suddenly they come for you whilst, you know, especially off the back of them crying on their podcast. It's just, wow. And especially off the back of the eyelid lift surgery. That was, what, an attempt to secure more roles. And now the industry is essentially, what, kaput? Hollywood doesn't exist anymore, really, right? They're operating these satellite studios all over America. I've heard about Tyler Perry doing something, right? It's just, oh, yeah, it's just mad, isn't it? And again, this, you know... Uh, and the COVID stuff is always funny considering how, you know, reckless they were in terms of how they dealt with it when they went on the road. It's just, it's kind of like, um, if you believed in karma, you would say this is some sort of karma. Again, I'm not that one that's person to say that because, again, you know, we don't know anything about people's lives. But if you were a believer in karma, you would say this is some sort of karmic retribution because it just seems weird, isn't it? It just came completely out of left field. <laughs> 
Oh, it's continued. It says, um, after the time published his article about Callum's alleged behavior Friday, he posted a message to his fans on Twitter noting he would record a podcast addressing the situation on Saturday. The podcast never materialized, but Shaw said he, he had every intention of defending Callum during the world beating, during the would be recording, until Callum suggested that that was not a sound decision. Again, they've dealt with this so much better than they did with the Crystalia situation. I wonder what happened. An amazing foresight from Callum. Well done, because that episode, again, I'm said, I said it already before on here. They should have, you know, I think he was just in the emotional and probably, you know, just really desperate to defend himself. I understand that. But getting on a podcast, rambling for, you know, an in, you know X amount of time on a very touchy subject, um, isn't the right thing to do, especially in the midst of what happened. I think if this would have happened pre Dalia, it would have been okay. Maybe it would have been okay. I don't know. Yeah, maybe it would have been okay because because Dalia is so famous and because he played that pedophile on that program, you right? It just I don't know because of the the screenshots as well really hurt him because I think a lot of this Callan's it feels like the Callan hate hasn't been as hard as it was with Dalia because I think the screenshots the, the the visual element of it really helped right the fact that these girls did look quite young and they had actual screenshots with his actual text right with his email address verified on there and with the pattern and how he spoke I think that really hurt him because it was more visual than this Callan thing which you know something happened in the 90s something happened with some of you know it doesn't necessarily read the same way I don't know why again maybe it's an age thing who knows which is odd really isn't it in that regard um it continues it says um i was this is kind of this is short talking he said i was like i'm gonna be your flavor flavor short record and he goes yeah but dude it was 21 years ago if i do that podcast you're gonna sit there and nod your head you're gonna look stupid let me handle this this isn't your fight this is my thing i'm gonna i'm not gonna drag you into this which is good to see him and i think you know again i we like to or i like to rag on the fact that la people aren't really friends and they just use each other for clout but it's good to see that they have surely have a brotherhood between each other because it seems like Callan was saying in between was hey go look after our main nest egg you know our main source of income at the moment let's not mess that up with my dumb allegations or with my in this you know um indecent behavior um, and let me just defend this on my own, which is good. And he, and he sort of put some distance on it. So much so, I think that even, I think the podcast episode bio has changed now and it says co-host. It says Brendan Schaub and then um, would co-host every week. So they're, um, I, it seems like they're actively taking steps to sort of distance themselves from Kellen at his request, it seems like, which is fair. I think if, if it was just Schaub doing it, then of course you'd be like, he's a shitty friend. But I don't think it's him. I think it's, you know, the... I think it's Callan actually suggested it, which is actually a good thing to see. And then the end here says, um, Shorb said he was having a difficulty, however, following Callan's request because not shooting from the hip and saying what's on my mind is against everything I know. He says, uh, it's hard for me to not to release the hounds and give you my true thoughts. I can't say anything that's going to satisfy anyone who wants me to give you my hot take. Anything I say is only going to hurt Brian. And that's the last thing I want to do, which is sound in it, sound um, interpretation. But he knows that for sure, man. And like if there's one person you don't want to defend you in public with this sensitive issue it would be brendan Schaub. he just you know he's definitely going to put his foot in it he's going to say something in, in, incredibly misogynistic it's going to come across very insensitive um he's going to make some broad sweeping statements and more likely than not especially if you listen to these podcasts and you read between the lines it feels as if they have more people in mind that they're trying to aim their guns at it doesn't feel like it's just going to end at um Brendan, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Brian Callan. It feels like other people are going to get um, hounded out too. And it made me think about Whitney Cummings, right? It made me think, wow, I'm surprised they haven't gone at Whitney, innit? Like, cause Whitney's been a bit of a terrible friend, right? Horrendous in this whole issue, especially if you believe the, the story about her and Chris D'Elia, where supposedly um, she, I think I've listened to it on another podcast, where supposedly she offered, um, she kind of offered D'Elia a lawyer, that she's used pre i don't know or someone's used previously that's a really good one f to deal with this issue that he's got concerning the allegation he has about grooming and then as soon as she offered him that she just ghosted him completely didn't pick up his calls anymore and then of course deleted his episode on her podcast and denounced him in public and you know made these weird vague statements about her how she's feeling you know i don't know she made some strange comments it just didn't feel like she was kind of backing up her friend right 
Um, and then of course the calendar things come out, and of course it's only been a couple of days, and she doesn't need to. You know, I, I don't. You don't need to reply to anything, but it's just interesting to see how she threw Chris under the bus, and no one said anything. But then in the same token, I'm also of the opinion because an, an article actually came out here from what? What's his paper called? Paja, Pajabi, Pajabia, Pajabia or something, right? This place called Pajabia. I'll put it on the screen. Let's get rid of that has this article now and they're trying to go after Whitney now which I think is completely unfair I'm not really down for it at all again I, I said in the beginning I don't think she's a great friend um, she obviously threw Chris under the bus but I think trying to because this is an article from Pajiba it says every social media post Whitney Cummins has made since Brian Callen's rape allegation came out like who cares what does she have to do with it it's not her responsibility how her friends um, how her male friends especially what they get up to you know, when they're not in her company she is not responsible for their actions and it's just bizarre especially if in this Me Too era to have it feels like is it yeah see if it's so bizarre to have another woman right going after another woman who happens to be friends with somebody who might have done something indecent like doesn't make any sense like what what does she have to do with it does she have to come out and what completely eviscerate him in public and then make herself look bad in front of all her comedian friends because they didn't because again if you're one of her friends and you see how she goes hard in the paint against chris or she completely disowns Callan, you're not going to be you're not going to be too comfortable being around her right because you don't know what she might do is if you get in trouble so she's stuck between a rock and a hard place but i just think again there's there's enough there's enough um creeps and monsters out there for the media to be really directing their attention to right um there's an ongoing issues at the moment now with the origis in china right that are being essentially what um there's them should being exterminated right from the population because they don't marry up with the authoritarian rule over there they can't practice their religion uh freely if it feels like for the sake of it right but concentrate on something like that that's a that's a good story to go on don't be handing out whitney cummins because she didn't reply the way you wanted her to reply it's uh, it's not on i'm not really down for it man but yeah that's the update i guess concerning um short and the fire and the kid and brian Callen. um let's see what happens again i think we can't make any sweeping assessments on it now i still think there is a um everyone deserves a day in court and it makes me think also actually imagine if these story imagine if the stories get proven to be false what then happens with the accusers do we how do we punish them like what or how, how do we how do they get punished is there some sort of con there should be a consequence um behind that like you can't just go around accusing somebody falsely and just you know go about your life swimmingly there should be something that happens but we just don't know how we deal with in society nowadays we, we probably don't even deal with accusations that well in the first place not so much so for false ones but it, uh, we probably need to return to a place it's not gonna may, it might not happen i assume but it would be nice to return to a place where we restore the severity in phrases and words right like racism and rape and stuff like they, they need to they need to still they don't have that weight that they used to have because people ban them around and throw them around willy-nilly right any sort of like regrettable sexual experience now is being classified as rape any kind of slight in what in um corporate america is somehow um assigned to racism we need to get to a place where we sort of assign those labels to situations when they merit so that we can deal with them accordingly and it'll just throw them around so they lose their relevance or they lose their potency or they lose their severity because at the moment that's what it sort of feels like right because he could let's say for real he could legitly be a creep right brian Callan could legitimately be somebody who kind of always oversteps the mark um doesn't read signs well um is the king of making people uncomfortable whatever it may be allegedly right he could legitimately be that guy but then that's not enough to kind of tar him with that brush so you throw all these other things at him to kind of bring him down it's like no you don't need to do that just focus on the thing that he actually did and and not all the other superfluous stuff that you want to um bury him with because he was a dick to you back in the day and again that's only if it's false if it's true of course you know um do what you have to do but if it's false we really need to kind of reconsider how we go about um dealing with these things in public i would say that's my opinion anyway on that one next on the list what do we have oh yeah sad news isn't it supposedly um r.i.p the church of what's happening now the podcast hosted by joey diaz is supposed uh, maybe quite possibly um ending uh joey diaz did a podcast episode the other day essentially talking about his uh big move he's moving back to new jersey which is i guess is great for him because if you've listened to the show recently you would know that he's, he's changed somewhat 
his mood has somewhat changed in the last few weeks. Obviously, most of it's due to the COVID and the pandemic and the lockdown across LA, not being able to perform stand up or go on tour. His kid having to be homeschooled, right? There's loads of things that can play into it, but it feels like the last few weeks, especially with him doing the show he did with them. Um, um, Oh, what's the show he did? What's his name? On the used to be on your mum's house. He did a show talking about his. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He's he's basically writing a book at the moment too, where he's every week he was called chronicling um, decades in his life and you know pivotal moments that basically made him the man who he is at the moment. And it seemed like going through or going down that um, reminiscing um, lane made him miss the old days and it miss his friends and you know being in LA. I imagine it can be a lonely experience. So he's decided to. Um, up sticks and head off to New Jersey and you know and you know can only wish that guy the best man um, that podcast was really f I don't know important for me especially during a certain time in my life when I was going through some stuff especially creatively and stuff like listen to somebody again he's much older than I am um, but talk about the same issues that you come you know with all creative sort of go through especially working within the sort of entertainment and tea kind of industry which is you know there is no clear path to success having someone tell you hey you're not it's not going to get better you know until you're 10 years in and even then you're still going to eat a bunch of shit um telling you to keep working telling you to kind of keep your eye on the prize he made me want to reread um the war of art um or the war on art is it the war on art right Stephen uh whatever his name is I forgot his name but yeah um that great book or the art of war is it the art of war or the war of art is it the war is it the war of art the art of war sorry by Stephen Pressfield he made me want to read that reread that a million times right he fucking loves that book so um yeah man i'm gonna miss joey diaz and the church of what's happening now i'm gonna miss lisa yeah. i'm gonna miss their guest one of my probably more favorite podcasts to listen to out of that comedy out of that la comedy click it's real it's to the point and it's so real and to the point that joey diaz was probably the person that had covid he assessed covid and its kind of um, effects on the economy and society the best like he really did like he was spot on with it he knew exactly how long this is going to go on he's the one that kind of gave me the idea that hey we're not going to get back into clubs or nightclubs you know that i'm more prevalent to be in until maybe the beginning of next year or until a vaccine comes around he was very early on telling people hey don't wait around for um benefits go out and try and get a job in a supermarket like he was early on that i think it may be march was telling people to not worry about waiting for a stimulus check go out and try and get any kind of job just so you can have something um in your in your pocket do you know what i mean and that was some really salient advice um for people out there and just in general about you know accepting he was one person that was telling us in the beginning hey just accept your lot and accept that this year is done basically effectively right accept his finish is over with um and reassess and make some changes right and i guess that's the beauty of listening to these sort of podcasts and learning from these guys because you know they're far more advanced in years and they have a lot more experience under their belt they've been through many things i've seen different things especially being a comedian traveling the country you know being exposed to different situations you know ups and downs in the economy and the industry um he knew very well that hey it's going to take at least six months for the industry to restart once everything reopens anyway so it's effectively done and what here we are when what we're in august and the year is effectively over isn't it it feels like unless a miracle vaccine comes out of the blue you, this to 2020 is a complete write-off so if you are on your sitting on your hands and you're not sure about making that career change or pivoting to something else this is the moment this is the time to make that change or moving somewhere else or you know trying a new thing whatever it may be this is the time to actually do it because God, you know by the time next year comes around you don't want to be doing the same thing you were doing previous years and there's also an argument to be said that the world won't be the same anyway even if when it does reopen it's sort of irre irrevocably changed forever really it feels like right um but yeah so um hopefully those guys will be okay going forward but yeah and i think even mentioned that they're gonna maybe try and record in august um and some maybe september and then maybe the new year and then of course there'll be a break until the new year and they will go from there but yeah that was such a great podcast again give it a listen uh the church of what's happening right now um with joey diaz one of my favorite podcasts out there next on the list what else we want to talk about Ooh, uh, this is from the same episode joey diaz um dropped this little nugget here right let me play it for you 
Joe Diaz dropped a little nugget concerning Joe Rogan and his effect, uh, his eventual move to Los Angeles. And I want to play it so you guys can hear what the deal is about. But it's very interesting development and something that I hadn't really thought about when um, the news first got out there that he was moving, right? Everyone sort of knew, okay, this guy's moving. He's going to Texas because he wants some more freedom um, and maybe the possibility to do comedy again when the economy does reopen. Uh, the only issue I think he probably has is that supposedly Texas, I think it's illegal to smoke marijuana. It's, sm it's illegal to have marijuana or to grow it, smoke, I don't know. Uh, okay, I, you know, and I know a lot yeah, of you guys, good. hey, I was a mechanic for 30 years. I've been scared. Yes, wait, I come on, come on. Computer's going slow as hell. Be let me load it up for you. Bear with me a second. Let's see if this loads. Okay, there we go. Come on. Can you show me the thing or is it gonna be jittery again? Don't want to be jittery. Let's see. Is it loading? It is. Oops, not really, is it? It's going mad slow today. Maybe because it's the encoder. I've have tried to change the settings a bit. And make muck around with the bit rates and all that malarkey, but maybe I've got too many We're Chrome awesome. windows open anyway. But let's just get this done. Is it gonna load? Yep, it's loaded finally. Okay, cool. So let's start that again. Oh, this computer is just hanging on in there, but I'm thankful for it. I'm not gonna complain because you know, pandemic going on at the moment. The last thing I need is trying to be dropping two grand on a new laptop in it. That's not the vibe. So Joey Diaz mentioned on his show um, a little snippet, a little news nugget concerning uh, Joe Rogan's eventual move to LA that has me thinking. Um, in, that, that it's an interesting development. That's, let, let's just say that because you know we don't really have any information about what he's going to do there. We just you know we just get the assumption that he probably wants a bit more freedom, um, lower rate of tax, and maybe the ability to do stand-up comedy again once everything sort of like settles down and every he kind of reopens but this little development made me think that we he might be actually up in a comedy club in general so this is from joey diaz and he sort of mentions the offer joe rogan made to him prior to him deciding that he wants to go back to new jersey it's around here boom 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 let's play um I'll mute that and then play. Fucking night of, of the seven fishes and all that shit. And we're over here eating the shittiest fucking pizza. <laughs> you know, we're over here eating shit. And listen, I was invited to move to Ro with Rogan. Joe is a fucking sweetheart. Uh, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse, to be honest with you. If you know Joe, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. But I didn't, listen, I've been gone from my area since 1993 so it seems like joe's offering his friends or within his little circle podcasting circle la comedy store circle the opportunity to go to texas with him now is he offering it as a way just to get his friends to live closer to him or is he offering is he trying to suggesting it hey you should come to texas with me I got this great opportunity or is it more so for him to um build this compound that he's been spoke he's speaking about it for years if you're a long time listener of joe rogan experience you'd know that he's been talking about you know having his own compound for time it's been one of his dreams and i guess maybe with you know allegedly having 100 m's sitting in your bank account from spotify it probably allows him a little bit more flexibility to do it right because you can do it you know on somebody else's dime you know but that kind of dipping into his own money that he makes on the podcast is a probably you know a great thing to do and if you've read or if you listen to any of the stories concerning joe on the podcast you know that he's extremely generous right he's helped out numerous people behind the scenes you know um to get right get them on their feet you know he's always very generous it feels like with the steak dinners when these guys are going on tour and stuff so it wouldn't be um out of character for him to decide to be like hey i will pay for you to come and live with me in texas i'll pay your rent for the year or whatever it may be or you can have this place for half the price whatever i'm not surprised he's doing it but it's really amazing that he's attempted to do such a thing and it made me think if as well the other potential is that he might be opening his own comedy store or his own comedy club sorry um i'm not too sure what the big comedy clubs are in texas don't um try and quiz me on that i'm not that familiar with that scene down there um i just listen to these guys podcast for the most part but i'd be interested to see how what he does because that's one that's been one of my only criticisms i feel like with a lot of these guys and similar with the djs too if i feel like a lot of these guys are listened to not the bigger ones because they they're, they're fine but a lot of the guys are 
coming up or in the middle tier they always complain about the spots they always complain about not getting showcased they always complain about not getting passed in certain places and a lot of them you know probably have the means especially with you know patreons and google adsense money they're making on youtube and selling of merch you know not watching anyone's pockets but i'm pretty sure they could probably all chip in a couple of grand here and there to buy a place where they can just perform you know week in week out similar to maybe what chris no, similar to what um what's his name dave Chappelle's doing at the moment right with um uh the thing he's doing is it in ohio i think he's doing it in wherever he's from right he's basically got a field where he sets up shop and has you know different comedic friends and hip-hop artists come down and play and perform in front of a crowd that's you know socially distanced and all that malarkey it feels like a lot of those guys should be doing the same sort of thing right instead of complaining like let's make something happen right let's try and fix it let's try and uh, come with a solution um let's buy an old comedy store and revamp it or let's invest in one and help out with the booking and the events manager i don't know something along those lines so it feels like we have finally have one of them putting their money where their mouth is and saying hey this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go open up a spot and invite all my friends who happen to be killers who happen to sell tickets because you know there's not gonna be it's not gonna, there's not gonna be a chance this place is gonna be full it's gonna be probably the hottest club in america when it does launch in it especially it's got Joe Rogan's name attached to it but I'm curious to know I'm curious to see actually whether or not he will attach his name to it as like an owner or whether or not he'll just be somebody that will kind of um you know be somebody that might front it as sort of like an investor or a family member but he actually owns the whole thing because I'd imagine running a comedy club will be it's not the easiest thing dealing with those egos dealing with those personalities it's not it's not a job that you'd want as a comedian right especially as a proper stand-up because it feels that's the that's the thing i've noticed too it feels as if joe doesn't need to make this move right he could stay in la and wait out until things reopen right he can sell his money and chill he gets his family's well established there as well they probably got their roots there they've been there for decades so he doesn't need to go so he's definitely going you know number one because he wants to do stand-up again wants to be able to perform right he doesn't necessarily he doesn't accept the fact that he won't be able to do stand-up in front of a crowd for another what six months be out of doing maybe let's say in total eight months he just can't afford to do that at his level right he needs to be on stage practicing every single night as much as he can or as much as it, you know the laws permit so he's number one going to texas for that but then also makes me think as well with the families like you'd have to even if you're a comedian and he did offer you a chance to go down there and live in his compound you'd have to make sure all the wives get on because I, I don't know how it is there in the states maybe it's different here but would just because your partner happens to be a, a comedian doesn't mean as a as again as a wife or as a partner doesn't mean you give a shit about the industry doesn't mean you care about his friends that just might be his job that you kind of see through your eyes isn't it you don't give a shit about being involved in his friends like you don't you know what i mean so it does really require a certain partner to be cool with having to move yourself and your family you know halfway across or you know down south somewhere in a state you've probably never been to just so your husband can be near his friends yeah it's not i don't know it doesn't seem like a proposition a lot of women will be down to or down for unless they get a little sweetener in it too i don't know but again um interesting to see how this develops over time is joe rogan i'm opening a comedy store is he going to invest in one is he just going there and opening and doing a compound doug stanhope style we don't know let me know your thoughts what do you think um he's going to do down there um in the comments down below next on the shoe what else do we have to say here oh supposedly there was an illegal rave in um in new york an illegal rave in new york under a bridge somewhere that people are regretting going to which is always funny and you know, people say that i regret going to this party it's like no you don't you regret you got caught right but it made me think about um how people are dealing with the pandemic especially in nightlife especially in you know with uh, people like myself that are involved with the nightlife uh, industry or that like to go out to raves uh to nightclubs um it must be a tough time in it when you're essentially a nocturnal animal and now you're locked in your home which for the most part is a place that you're running away from every night when you're getting out right and now you're sort of locked in it or you're trying to make the parks your new club which doesn't really work the same um I wonder how people are dealing with it i'm i've been okay with it to be fair i've kind of again i've accepted my fate i know that i won't be in a nightclub again until the new year i know i won't be comfortable to go to another nightclub until the new year anyway, or until the vaccines around in it because 
we know we already know enough about the virus to know that you know it spreads more often in closed environments you know we had that what was that case in Guangzhou right where it spread in a diner somewhere um, really quickly and only one person actually was positive and it ended up you know spreading to loads of other people um, that person I think was asymptomatic as well which made it worse but I've kind of accepted my lot I'm okay with not having to rave for the year I've got pirate studios I can go to with friends and hang out and play tunes you've got the ability to go to a park and hang out with your friends and take a bluetooth speaker it's not the best but you know it's not shit you can rave at home and watch a live stream so there, there is options available it's just not the one that i would like to go to but i don't think i would necessarily put myself in harm's way just to go and rave somewhere especially under a bridge you know that's just not the vibe but this uh, these people i guess feel like they needed to do such a thing so this is the article here from pitchfork detailing the events and also a, bit, a couple of quotes from the djs in question someone called pitcher plane as well that's a terrible name already so i'm assuming the music was absolutely horrendous but an article from pitchfork here says picture picture plane picture plane God almighty, terrible name. Try again. On DJ in Brooklyn, rave during pandemic. I don't think it was worth the risk. Oh, really? Now you don't think it was worth the risk with the picture plan. And if you've not seen the image on the screen here, he's got a t-shirt with a fake, br with a picture of like a woman. I guess one of those kind of kooky t-shirts with a woman on it printed on the front with a bra and fingerless gloves. Like he's Andrew Dice Clay. He's got a wrist full of wristbands from previous events that he doesn't want to take off, you know. Or maybe all of them are VIPs. And, you know, he just looks like somebody that you wouldn't want to go and rave with, really. But, hey, let's continue. It says, um, late Saturday night, August the 1st, a group called the Renegade hosted a free secret rave underneath a Brooklyn side, the Brooklyn side of whatever that word is, bridge in New York City. Featuring sets from Picture Plane, DJ Mazo Mazabay. <laughs> what? Mazabay? That's a mad name. The party, like many underground events in New York, was technically illegal, unsanctioned by the city or state. Several videos depicted um party girls in close proximity many without mask uh reach via email picture planes travis edgley tells pitchfork it felt incredible to dj um after being alone in my house for basically six months and i'm sure a lot of people there felt the same but i don't think it was worth the risk looking back on it now oh yeah looking back on it now so let's check the videos out actually because i want to see what this what actually happened here i love the whole looking back on it. it wasn't it wasn't worth it oh sure mate sure you go ahead and have your fun and then when you come back it's not gonna be okay where is it what can i see this video not my videos is it on here can you load actually maybe i might have the video down here where is it yep there you go there's a video there right let's see this picture plane party it sounds like absolute dog shit though but maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm completely in the wrong key and it was a good event <sighs> Okay, there we go. It's loading now. Ba, 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 ba. Come on, YouTube. I'm gonna have to restart this actually when I finish this. But for now, let's see what this picture plane's about. I bet there's lasers and NAF rave gear, you know, and people on too much MDMA. Just imagine. But I guess, you know, especially New York as well, right? They had the most case in the beginning. They kind of handled it pretty well now. People are you know out and about doing their thing it feels like but god damn it man the desire to go out it must be strong in it to go and party under the bridge during the pandemic that could never be me though could never ever be me okay is it loading come on jesus christos here we go a little bit more and it'll be up on your screen i think i've got too many windows open that's probably the reason why this is happening to me i've learned my i'm gonna learn my lesson sooner rather than later Let's see. Come on. Where are you? Is it here? God damn you. It's still not loading. Okay, let's just continue reading the article. It's going to take too long. Da, 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 da. So, um, it says here, 
Um, I had never worked with those promoters before, said Pitcher Plain. When we spoke on the phone the day before the event, I expressed reservations and told them I was nervous about DJing it and that I was aware of the backlash from a previous rave that happened a few weeks ago. So why do you do it, you plunker? He says, um, they told me that this was one This one would be super safe and that the mask and sanitizer and water would be provided <laughs> to everyone who entered. And when I saw the video, the location, it looked enormous. Water, you know, what's water going to do in a rave? He said, I figured that was a, it was a large enough space that people would be tons of room and wouldn't be different than going to a, like a rockaway beach on a Saturday. Okay, I was pretty much surprised at the crowd and of course everyone just crowded around the sound system. It felt incredible to DJ after being in my house for six basically six months and I'm sure a lot of people felt the same, but I don't think it was worth the risk looking back. I definitely won't be going to any events like that again while COVID's happening and I really hope that no one got sick after this event. <sighs> that's the that's the that's the that's the problem, right? I guess. I'm okay with going, right? I think if you wanna go do your thing, right? whatever uh take your own it's your own personal responsibility i think there's enough information out there at the moment now for you to make an informed decision as an adult as a grown-up about how you want to deal with this pandemic and if you decide the best way to deal with this to go out to a crowded venue somewhere god bless godspeed but i guess the issue is even if you're a dj and you're gagging to go and play out in front of a crowd and you're uh, you know uh, a club girl you're gagging to go you know dance in front of a dj you know in a dimly lit room you don't want to be the person that essentially gets sick and potentially contaminates loads of other people who are more at risk than you are and they unfortunately pass away or have some mad reaction to the virus because you decide to go to a rave under a bridge that would be the worst way right you feel so guilty i'd imagine fair enough if you happen to be in a supermarket shopping or you happen to be taking a daily walk you know whatever it may be right something super innocuous and you accidentally got somebody um infected because you didn't know you're asymptomatic that's fine but knowingly going to a place that you shouldn't be going to under conditions that are not ideal for the virus it just feels like a disaster waiting to happen i don't know why you'd actually do that i really don't and i guess as a dj too you'd want, want to have that in your consciousness right someone getting sick of the event that you were playing at that would feel awful man that would feel so 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 bad and let's see this video here. i think it's loaded i should want to see what it looks like so this is the actual video supposedly from the event let's see what the vibe is <laughs> That doesn't look socially distanced to me. It looks pretty cool, don't get me wrong. Being able to rave under a bridge in the outdoors is always going to look amazing on pictures, right? I remember that gig once. Um, that little secret, or that little secret, or that little that surprise gig that Skepta did. I think maybe to tie in with the release of his album, Konnichiwa, Under the Bridge. Was it Konnichiwa? It might be Konnichiwa. Remember that? In Shoreditch, she did that thing under the bridge. That was so good. Um, I actually remember going to a few raves and warehouses around the area, but that was uh, really cool to see actually um, in video form. That looked bloody amazing. Everyone vibing. That was, you know, days gone by. So as a setting, it looks pretty beautiful, right? To be under a bridge next to the river, next to the river somewhere, I guess in New York, I'm not sure where it is, uh, you know, lit by nightlife, but bloody hell, it just doesn't look safe. Bouncing around. Is that the sound from the actual studios or is that just like somebody overlapped because the sound sounds disgusting. It sounds disgustingly bad. What's that say? Perseverance or something on the banner. I don't know if that's the Mars thing. Or that's them just raving. Wow. It's a lot of people, man. I don't know just look just again no offense and merited at anyone that went there but that looks like an std rave in it looks like mad stds mad i don't know stuff that you shouldn't be taking that's been cut to shit white people with dreadlocks people playing hacky sack this looks like the worst rave in the world nondescript white girl shaking her her colored hair in the background like again that's not worth the risk for me man it really isn't there's 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 way other things i'd much rather do than be going to a rave to do something like that man it doesn't feel like the best place to do but again if you're going out if you're going to go out somewhere watch someone called picture plane or dj you probably deserve everything that's coming your way i'm afraid you probably deserve everything that's coming your way and then 
to end it, I guess, we have another illegal rave, actually, that I'm going to put up here on the screen um, that happened to affect Paris, actually, oddly enough, right? Um, anyone that's been to Paris will know that it's not the... Um, whenever you think of Paris, you don't really think of techno, do you, right? You don't really think of great nightclubs either. Paris is one of those weird places that it seems like it only kind of makes sense or only works if you know people that live there right if you have friends or you have people that have been there prior or people visiting or you happen to be going to go or you happen to just be part of a cool click people when people show you around paris it really turns into a completely different city but when you go there yourself or you go there off the back of watching a couple youtube videos about it and maybe picking up some spots on the vice article or whatever it may be you think one thing and then when you get there it's a complete other thing it's not the same situation at all it's not the most spontaneous city in the world you really do need some instruction or some direction as to where to go in order to make the experience worthwhile so it doesn't necessarily um, give you any kind of confidence that you'd go there and you'd find good kind of techno raves or parties and stuff. It doesn't feel like that place. But this new, um, I guess they're new, maybe a couple of years in the founding, um, collective called Possession in Paris. They put together these really cool outdoor raves in um, abandoned warehouses and open air places all over the place, right? Somewhere, some usually in the suburbs of Paris on the outskirts, I'm guessing on the outer ring so they can kind of... Um, uh, avoid the glances of police that happen to be patrolling around there. You know, those police officers have been in, in what you call it in France, so they have those little weird orange armbands or whatever it may be. So they had a rave, I think, recently that I'm going to try and get up here if it can bloody load on these screens. They had a rave recently, actually, that they put on that looked like super fun, but it also made me think, God damn it, man, that's a risk that not a lot of people are willing to take. I don't think I'll be willing to take actually to go to a rave of that magnitude, um, especially during these testing times. And it made me think about the DJs willing to do it too, because I guess when you're doing that, you're in the knowledge, you're knowing, you know full well um, that you are probably going to get a lot of backlash online. You're probably going to get a lot of people um, criticizing your decision and telling you that you're wrong, which you clearly are, I guess, right? Because, you know, you're not permitted to go out. Um, to these kind of gatherings and dance around in any under any circumstances Don't anyway oh, what's going on here whoops there we go take that off there so let me get to try to get this to close down if i can force this to quit then i'm going to continue talking about this possession techno rave bear with me one second get this to quit yep it's finally quit okay so it made me think about the people involved if you're a dj going there it must be a bit stressful thinking about you know whether or not you're going to get someone accidentally ill for attending your rave and of course there's also that desire just to go and just you know have some sort of semblance of normality i definitely understand that i think spending this much time at home uh being constrained to your small apartment bedroom house whatever it may be even a mansion doesn't matter man forcefully being told to stay indoors and you know seek cover and comfort in the locality of your friends if they are happen to be local if they're not local then you're completely fucked but i get the desire to go back out i really do i definitely understand it i just don't think um, the juice is worth the squeeze that's my only issue with it and if i can get this video to load up i'll show you what it actually looks like and it does look like fun to be completely honest so that's the problem as well isn't it? you see the video you see people dancing around you see them you know hugging each other openly and not being worried about catching anything and you think damn man damn daniel i miss that i miss that feeling of being surrounded by strangers i don't know getting involved in dumb conversations in the toilet um adding people on facebook and instagram that you're never going to speak to again right those were the times those were the times when we were really living so this is a video that i kind of pulled from loads of instagram stories um, via Instagram, so so loads of people from Instagram stories that happen to be attending the event. Hopefully, this isn't snitching or getting them in trouble, but it's just interesting to see how people are dealing with uh, COVID, especially in France, considering they had a rise of I think fifty four percent cases in the last what week or so. So it hasn't been the best time to be a uh, Parisian or to be somebody of French descent living in France. <laughs> but this is look like France. This just looks like this looks like France. It's like fun. It's add one, 
and who immediately lands and I think some guy called Shlomo playing not the Shlomo you're used to another Shlomo dude but it looks like fun man it looks freaking good so I guess the first thing to note is it's all outdoors and it's all open air um, that obviously makes it a lot more safer than it would be indoors because you know COVID allegedly doesn't spread as easily outdoors but in a, and for the most part a lot of people in the crowd too has have masks on I think you know they're keenly aware they shouldn't be out anyway but it makes me think as well what kind of parent would not would let their parent not let their kid go out but it must be an interesting conversation to try and persuade your even your housemates as well I wonder how comfortable they'd be knowing that you're going out raving with hundreds of different people coming in contact with them it's not you know it's probably going to make for a very awkward conversation <laughs> And playing, fast forward a bit, slow on decks. It looks like bloody thunder, doesn't it? Just imagine being there. Immediately lens playing for free outdoors. That must be cool. Or oh, free-ish, because you know it's not free, you still have to pay. You pay in it. You pay to get the address location and stuff and tickets, and I guess they use that as track and tracing information. I don't know. I'm hoping they do. She seems excited, isn't it? Even all the big ones they're excited to be playing out because no one's playing out so it's all fun isn't it everyone on their phones there looking fun but would you go I, I, I don't think I, I, I would um, and again if you know me you'd know that I'm, I'm obsessed with going to flipping nightclubs and stuff but I don't think I could go I don't think I could do it man I don't think I could be comfortable in the knowledge um, that I'm around so many different people from all walks of life because that's essentially what a nightclub that's what essentially what a, um, a gathering like this is all about anyway right it's about being amongst so many different people from all different all different colours of creeds or different backgrounds but in the pandemic terms it's probably a petri dish um, conditions for the virus to spread it looks like fun doesn't it oh Techno dancing, I've not seen that in a while, innit? Amazing. Twerking in all sorts. I like that t shirt they've got though, it's good merch. It's good bloody merch. Again, good Amelie Lens playing there. She loves a good filter, doesn't she? She loves a good filter, Amelie. Loves a good hand wobble. Fair play, man. Looks like fun, though. I'm not gonna lie. Looks like fun. But yeah, I don't know if I could do it, man. I don't know if I could do it. But I'll leave it there. If you still want your taste of uh, techno video information, I'll put the link to the whole video in my um, description of the podcast. So you can check it out yourself. But I can't do it, man. I'm too scared. I'm too much of a scaredy cat to do that stuff. Um, you know, what would I do? Like, you know cover myself in a hazmat suit and try and make that work like nah not for me not for me anyway that has been the excellent english episode number 350 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's your first time listening of course make sure if you're watching actually via the youtube make sure you smash that like button down below hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below with your thoughts and of course if you can extend um, assistance on the old patreon then click on that as well uh, you'll get the episode in full in audio format a couple of days before everybody else and you, if you want to also add me on the socials you'll find that down below you know on the pinned comment you'll find on my social media links on there as well so make sure you give me a follow on your instagram and twitter until then take care be safe and of course you know make sure you're social distancing yourself from that malarkey keep away from strange looking people <laughs> hug your friends if you can and yeah just try and make the best of this weird situation we're in at the moment in it um it's all unprecedented it's all up in the air it's not your fault whatever you're going through and just try and hang in there as best as you can and we'll hopefully come out of this the other side stronger than ever until then peace <laughs>